Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. You are watching Women's View live here on Ahubi TV. As always, uh, I'd like to remind you that this is a live show, so um, inshallah, with today's topic um, already on Twitter, a very popular one apparently, um, we would love to get your views. Today's topic uh, is something very relevant, very strongly associated um, with the Lady of Light, Fatima Tazara alayhi salam, um, and it being the season of mourning her tragedy and mourning her martyrdom, um, it's only appropriate that we at least make an effort to try and see what lessons we can gain from her life. So today's topic, um, we entitled it Hijab and Modesty Through the Eyes of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. Um, hijab has been such a um, huge topic, especially with the you know recent um, current affairs surrounding hijab here in the West especially. So inshallah, it would be great to hear from you. We'd love for you to join the discussion. The number is on your screen, 0203 4117842. You can tweet at Ahubate TV, you can tweet me, you can comment on our Facebook page, and finally, you can email womensview at ahubate.tv. We'd love to hear your experiences, um, any words of advice, any um, anything you'd like to contribute to tonight's discussion. You're more than welcome to do so. Um, without further ado, my wonderful guest tonight is um, Sister Masma Jafar. Thank you so much for joining me today. No problem. Um, I'm sure, I mean, I know we have quite a significant non-Muslim viewership, so um, for those wondering what exactly do we mean when we say hijab, what is hijab? Um, what is hijab? <laughs> okay, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, Hijab is the word that is used to identify the covering that a Muslim woman wears nowadays. Um, it doesn't just mean the headscarf, it means the full covering. So when people talk about hijab, um, it's not just the headscarf, it's, it's the full covering of the Muslim woman. Okay, and in terms of what um, the Quran and the narration say about this, um, you know, what kind of instructions do we have? Um, well, we have um, in the Holy Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that, um, you know, we have to cover ourselves. Yeah. Um, the verses are in Surah An nur um, verse 30 and 31, and it actually starts off with um, talking to the men first. Yep. So it says, say to the believing men that they cast down their looks and guard their private parts. This is yep. pure for them. Indeed, Allah is aware of what they do. Mm -hmm. So again, um, showing that the hijab starts from the men's side, where yep. they cast down their looks and guard their private parts. Yeah. And then it goes on to, surah number, uh, to verse number 31, where God says, and say to the believing women that they cast down their looks and guard their private parts. So the same sort of instructions that was given to the men are given yeah. to the women. But then God continues with, and do not display their ornaments except what, what is apparent and let them wear their head coverings over their bosoms yeah. and not display their ornaments except to their husbands and then it goes on to say who the, the people, that, the men folk um, and the women that they're allowed to display their ornaments to so who they don't have to wear hijab in front of yeah. and then it finishes with um, and let them not strike their feet so that what they hide of their ornaments may be known and turn to Allah, um, all of you, O believers, so that you may be successful. Okay. That is the main two verses that talks about hijab. Um, you've got another verse in Surah Azab, which talks about pulling your um, overgarments around you so that you may be known. But this one actually talks about the head covering and how it should cover you know, your, your chest yeah. area and the fact that we should not display um, our ornaments except what is apparent yeah and um, the scholars have said that that refers to everything except the face and the hands yeah so everything else has to be covered yeah. it's um it's interesting because if we look at um not just western media but just the concept of hijab in general i think a lot of people kind of overlooked overlook the fact that there is also hijab prescribed for men and it's kind of seen as, you know, this this restriction solely for women, and and then you know the other connotations follow. Mm -hmm. um, 
prior to the show, we actually, uh, at Hubate TV, uh, we tweeted a statement and we wanted to get your views on the statement. Um, I believe we said that um, the statement was, I dress modestly um, and in order to be modest, I don't need to cover my hair. And it was interesting to see, you know, the sorts of response, responses we've had so far. Um, so we have a brother, uh, I'm not sure if he wants his name exposed or not, but I will read out his tweet. He said, as a male, I guarantee that covering hair makes such a difference to even the way a man looks at you, even if the rest is modest. Um, and then we've had, you know, differences of opinions, discussions still going on. But um, we do have a short clip to show you, um, which goes into a bit more detail about the specification of head covering. Um, so the fact that hijab doesn't just mean to dress modestly, but it's a lot more specific than that. So um, here is that video right now for you. Um, okay, we seem to not have the video <laughs> at the moment, but no problem. Um, but I mean, you know, the verses you mentioned mm -hmm. were also quite um, instructive and quite clear. I think the I think the argument um, generally is um, that God doesn't specifically say cover your head. So a lot of um, people will say, well, we don't need to as yeah. long as we're modestly dressed, we're covering yeah. our chests, our bosoms, then that's fine. But if you look at the verse, it actually says and pull your head coverings over your bosoms. Mm -hmm. now, if God wanted us just to cover our yeah. bosoms, he would have said, just cover your bosoms. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the fact that he said, pull your head coverings over your bosoms, shows that you know, the head covering was, was there. there and should still be there. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, God uses words, all the words that he uses are very specific. It's not yeah. just you know, like the way we talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we know that in that, those days, um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the time when the Quran was revealed, yeah. women used to wear head mm -hmm. coverings, but they used to wear it around the back of yeah. their, they tie it around the back of their neck. So this area would be shown. Mm -hmm. So God says, no, cover, you know, bring it down. Bring it forward, yeah. Yeah, bring it forward and cover your bosom. So it's not, oh, don't cover your head, just cover your bosoms. Yeah. It's a matter of continue covering your head. Yeah. but cover your bosoms at the same time. Yeah, so... Yeah, it's, it, it's, if I give you an example, which may be a little bit crude, but I think it sort of puts the point across really yeah. well. Um, I'm sure you, you've noticed nowadays when you go down the street, you've got these, these um, kids who wear their trousers sort of falling yeah. very much down. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if, if God was to say, you know, um, pull your trousers so that it covers your undergarments, yeah. then... It would be silly for someone to turn around and say, oh, you don't need to wear trousers. You just need to cover your, the top of your undergarments yeah. because that's what is being yeah. told. You know, it, it, it's assuming yes, you're wearing trousers, but just pull it up so we don't need to look yeah. at the undergarments. So it's yeah. the same sort of principle. Yeah. So I guess, you know, these verses need to be looked at in context. Yes, I think what we tend to do is, you know, sort of pull out what we want to from the Quran yeah. to suit our own needs. And, you know, God says in the Quran himself that, you know, if, if there is a disease in your heart, the Quran will actually increase that disease. So if yeah. you go into the Quran with a perceived notion and try to use the Quran to prove that, then, then you will go wrong. Yeah. And, it's, and again, we also know that the Quran itself is not enough. We've got the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. You know, yeah. the Holy Prophet has given the Hadith of Thakalain where, yeah. you know, it's the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. So again, if you look at the Ahlul Bayt, all the women were covered in this very specific way. Yeah. So again, you know, we need to take lessons from that. Definitely. Um, one of the um, very famous sayings of Fatima Zahra um, is one that confuses a lot of people. Um, if I read it out, she has said, um, the best thing for a woman is not to see men and not to be seen by men. And at first glance, a lot of people would jump to conclusions and you know all sorts of ideas mm. kind of come rushing to our minds um but again we need to look at this in context you know does she just mean in terms of physically seeing or you know because that would wouldn't be practical at all here in the west <laughs> um but i mean what does she mean by that and what what does it mean to say the best thing for a woman okay um looking at this this hadith um First of all, you've got to take into account that she doesn't, you know, it's, it's the best thing. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the most perfect yeah. thing. Um, and you've also got to realize that whenever 
you're in a, you know you go out and you ex you know you're you're in front of a male there's always a chance that he may look at you um you know w with a look that is not appropriate even if you are covered f yeah. from head to toe that that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't it's like you know um whenever we go out there's a chance that we may get mugged or robbed you know there is always that yep. chance you know mm -hmm. you can't sort of protect yourself if you if if from that yeah um, so yes, the, the, the most perfect thing would be to be in a situation where no man can see you, so no unlawful look can be, you know, seen to you, and yeah. and you don't see any men either, because again, um, you know, I think we need to understand how we have been created. So again, it's, I think the thing is to remember that God has created us in a specific way for a reason, yeah. and we need to be aware of that. Um, I believe. And it's been proven that women have been created in order to attract the opposite sex because um, that's how the race will survive. So we flirt with the opposite sex in order to attract them so that we can then procreate mm -hmm. and the human race continues. Yeah. Now, we do this without even realizing that we're doing it. Yeah. So the hijab is there to help us to keep that barrier. Um, whereas the man has been created again to be attracted to the to, to us so that again the procreation happens and the human race continues yeah. now that is a desire that God has put into the man um, and because he's put these you know um, specific things in us he's told us how we can best live where these things um, are controlled and don't become very animalistic yeah so the best thing yes would be in a situation where you don't see a man so you're not able to flirt even unknowingly, and a man doesn't see you, so he does not look at you in, you know, any unlawful way. But obviously, as you said, that's impractical, yeah. especially living, you know, I think living in any country, it's yeah. impractical, not just in the West. Um, so how I look at it, um, one of the first things that we were taught when, we were, when I was doing counselling was that there's a difference between hearing and listening. We all hear, but we don't <laughs> tend to listen. Mm -hmm. And we were taught this concept of active listening. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the same with looking and seeing sort of things. So we all sort of, you know, we're all seeing things, but we're not actually looking at it. Yeah. So when um, Bibi Fatima al-Islam says that, you know, you shouldn't actually be seeing, it's like you, you may interact with the person on what is required, but you don't actually see them in the way that you're sort of noticing every part of their yeah. look. You're mm -hmm. actually just interacting on what is required. And in the same way that they don't see you. So if they were to be asked what color eyes did she have, they wouldn't be able to tell because yeah. they didn't actually look at you in that much intensity. Yeah. And that's where the first part of the hijab comes in where he says, you know, where God says to cast down your glance. So it's not sort of constantly looking down. Yeah. It's not looking with that intensity that you notice the looks of that person. Yeah. And I think that makes more sense in this with this hadith yeah. that you you may go out and Bibi Fatima al-Islam herself went out, you know, when it was necessary. Yeah. Again, knowing that every time you do, you may come across an unlawful look, which you don't want, because mm. what we need to realize is all the um, rules of Islam are things that help us to protect our soul. Yeah. So every unlawful look has damaged our soul. Mm -hmm. So again, if it is not necessary to go to a certain place or to be in a certain place, then we need to think, do I really need to go there or be there? Yeah. Um, but there are times when it is necessary, and Bibi Fatima al-Islam showed that when it is necessary, she went out. Yeah. And also, if you look at Bibi Fatima al-Islam, Bibi Zainab al-Islam, they all held classes in their houses. Mm -hmm. So although they may not be coming out, they were encouraging women to come out of their houses to come to them yeah. for classes. So again, if it was something that, no, you shouldn't come out, and mm -hmm. no man should see you, then they wouldn't have encouraged other women to come out and yeah. to the classes. So. You know, it, it's, we need to live in the world, yeah. but we need to live in the world in a way that will minimize the damage that it does to our soul. Definitely. Um, it's interesting because, you know, so, so much of the time people ask, well, you know, why is it only for women? Surely men should have to cover up as well. And I think you explained it, you know, <coughs> pretty well, but there's, I guess there's a difference between being equal and being identical. Mm. Um, Interestingly enough, just this week I was um, reading an article in the Huffington Post, I'm sure the viewers would be able to find it. Um, it was entitled something like 10 laws we can't believe are still around or something like this. And it was written by an American lady and she had written this article complaining about 
um, some laws that still exist in the United States that she believes are kept or have been you know kept in place to keep women in line <laughs> and so I started reading this article and it was really interesting because the more laws I kept reading um, so for example one of the laws said I think there are two states in the US where a man can get prosecuted if he proposes to a woman and then he doesn't follow up on it wow <laughs> yeah so I mean there were all the, these really peculiar <laughs> and weird laws and she was campaigning and saying, you know, they're doing this to keep us in line and, you know, it's they want men to have all the freedom. And I was thinking, actually, wouldn't this be a good thing? Surely, mm -hmm. you know, this is there to protect us. Um, interesting enough, there's actually a town in California where uh, if a woman wants to wear high heels longer than two inches, you have to get a permit from the local <laughs> council um, because of liability and lawsuits and things like that. So... I just thought I'd give that um, fact to the viewers. But on a serious note, you know, this whole, I think the misconception and the confusion between being equal and being identical often kind of makes women themselves sell themselves short, mm. I suppose. I think we're trying too much to be identical to men and that doesn't work because we've been created differently for different purposes yes. and I and, and you notice now it's like you know we've got to a stage in the west where a woman can now do you know apply for any job that a man can mm -hmm. apply for but they're not any happier yeah so it shows that you know you're not getting that it's, mm. it's not helping yeah um it's you know and it, it's about sort of knowing what you're good at it's like you know it's like when you know what your child is good at and then you force them to do something else yeah it, it doesn't work mm -hmm. you have to see what your strengths are and god's telling us you know that this, these are the strengths of women and these are the strengths of men. And that's how it works. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's important to know that. I think the other thing, um, I, to sort of, I, I've lost my train of thought, but <laughs> the other thing I was looking at, the other thing I was looking at is, um, I was looking at this um, video on YouTube yeah. um, of this American convert who used to be a model and she converted to Islam and she started wearing the hijab. And she was saying that while she was a model, um, you know, she believed that, you know, if you've got it, flaunt it. And why not? Why not yeah. make money on the assets that she mm -hmm. has? And she didn't think that there's anything wrong with it. But it was only when she was introduced to hijab, she realized how little she had thought of herself in those times yeah. when she was modeling and how much more self-respect she had and how much more respect other people had towards her yeah. as well. And, you know, that's her own experience where mm -hmm. she's actually experienced both sides of the coin and she's seen, yeah. you know, the difference. And... Funnily, it's, I was actually listening to the radio this afternoon when I was going to pick up my son from school, and they were talking about how in the brownies and in the girl guides, they've got this new badge where they're trying to teach them how to um, be more comfortable with their own bodies. And, and it was about respecting your own body or something like that. Because they found that girls in primary school, now this is below the age of 10 mm -hmm. in primary school, were dieting and missing meals because they thought they were fat. And they weren't obese. They were like size, you know, they were normal average yeah. children, but they thought that they were obese. And they were dieting and missing meals in order to get this perfect um, body that is constantly being shown in the media. Mm -hmm. And it shows that, you know, if you don't have this concept of hijab, you're constantly having to sort of play to this this image of what you should look like yeah. and if you don't look like that then you won't succeed yeah. in life whereas when i have my hijab on i will succeed because of who i am yeah. because of my intellect because of my purity my soul not because of what i look like yeah. and that gives me so much more self-worth and it gives me it allows me to focus on what's important rather yeah. than spend hours trying to look good for yeah. other people definitely um I mean, that's really interesting. Just, I think a couple of months ago, we had a show um, about unrealistic standards mm -hmm. of beauty. And again, there was a study that showed that there were girls as young as 10 who were feeling pressurized to mm. wear makeup. And then, you know, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, I came from the Stone Ages or anything, but when I was 10, it's you enjoyable. know, my mom's eyeliner was just another pencil <laughs> that I used when I couldn't find mine. Um, so, I mean, I, I think in, probably in the last 
um, decade or two, I think the, that pressure on women has probably increased more mm. than it has ever before. And I think that's because of the media and, and the airbrushing techniques that they've got where they can sort of, you know, make a size 10 woman look like a size 6 woman, yeah. you know, and, and we're all expected to look like that. And why? It's like, you know, tell me to aim for something a little bit yeah. higher than what I look like. Yeah. It's like, you know, the way I look is what God has created me as. Yeah. And that's not to do with me. Okay, I, I understand you have to be healthy, but mm -hmm. there's a difference between being healthy and being anorexic yeah. or, you know, things like that. But the other thing that you mentioned about how, um, you know, people tend to think that hijab is just for the women, I think that is within the Muslims as well. In fact, I think more in the Muslims, you know, in like, I think the males tend to think that hijab is just for the women because yeah. they see hijab as a covering and that's it. And yet hijab isn't, it's, it's a state of mind as well. So it's about, you know, making sure that they don't interact with us as well. It's not just about us not interacting, but they, you know, they think it's okay for them to sort of joke around and, and you yeah. know, sort of talk quite easily, whereas we should be the ones who are holding back, and that's not fair. And I think in this day and age, because times have changed so much, I think the male Muslims have to realize that there should be a certain type of covering for them as well, yeah. um, because women do look nowadays in the olden days, you know, women were a lot more reserved and, you know, you'd never have a woman sort of, you know, making the first move, whereas nowadays it's, it's, it's quite you know, common, yeah, it's yeah. quite common. So I think, I mean, we have, you know, within the fic that if you um, do anything that m may attract the opposite sex, then you shouldn't. So if you've, you know, if you've got a good body and you're wearing like sleeveless tops, even if you're a guy, that's wrong because you will attract the opposite sex. So I think there is a hijab of dress for men as well, yeah. if they know that they're going to wear something which will attract females, then mm. then they can't. You know, they can't be doing that because it's it's not fair. Yeah. I know we have uh, a significant male viewership as well, <laughs> so um, it'll be interesting to to see um, what the viewers have to say about that. But uh, just once again, I'd like to remind the viewers that this is a live show, so we'd love to hear from you if you have any comments, um, if you have any experiences, if you'd like to input to the discussion we're having this evening. The number is on your screen, 0203 Um You can tweet at Ahube TV, you can tweet me, you can comment on our Facebook page, you can email, finally, womensview at ahube.tv. Um, we kind of touched on... Um, integrating into society and you know we spoke about how um lady fatima and lady zainab they did engage with society mm -hmm. um and i was i was about to say they did engage in society despite their hijab but that would be completely wrong because <laughs> it it's hijab that allows you to yeah, exactly. uh, integrate with society but what about modern mainstream society today um you know I know quite a few sisters who um, have removed the hijab because of, for example, their job, or they're more likely, which which is, which may be true, it might be true that you are more likely to get accepted without hijab, but, I mean, it's not a reason to take it off, but does hijab really restrain women that much in today's society? I think it depends. Um, it can do. Um, if you've got a bigoted person in front of you who's interviewing yeah. you, then of course it will. But I think as a Muslim, um, we have to believe and know that God is there and he's taking care of it. And in mm -hmm. the end, he's in control. Yeah. And if you do it with the near that you're doing it for God, then he will take care of it. Yeah. So if you don't get that job, you'll get another job. He mm -hmm. won't abandon you because you're following his rules. Yeah. And I think it's knowing that and believing that. Yeah. Um, you know, and do you really want to fit into a society which won't accept you for who you are mm. and wants you to flaunt yourself just to get a job or to get into, you know, a, a certain university or whatever? It has to be, you know what, take me for who I am. Take me for my intellect. Yeah. Don't take me because, you know, I dress a certain way or I don't dress a certain way. That That's wrong. Yeah. And I think we need to sort of stand up. And those who have any decency and any intellect will actually respect you for that yeah definitely because it shows that you're, you're willing to stand up for what you believe in yeah even when it comes to just 
not small things, but even when it comes to kind of day to day things like um, having to go and pray during the middle of the day or, you know, not shaking hands or, you know, things like this. Um, even with that, you kind of find that people are a lot less offended <laughs> than you expect they would be. Mm. Um, I have run out of time for this session of the show, but thank you so much. It's been brilliant so far. Um, dear viewers, please do join us after the break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. Welcome back from that break. Uh, for those of you who have just tuned in, today we are discussing hijab and modesty through the eyes of Lady Fatima. Um, inshallah, today we want to look at what lessons we can gain um, from Lady Fatima in this aspect of her life and apply it into our own in this day and age. Um, for those of you uh, who have just started watching prior to the break, um, we kind of went through the, the kind of basic fundamentals of, you know, what is hijab? Um, why do we, you know, uh, need to wear hijab? And there was an interesting quote by um, Fatim Tazaha alayhi salam also that we discussed. Um, but for those of you who weren't watching uh, prior to the break, there was a video that I wanted to show you, which I can now can show you. Um, this video explains um, kind of what we discussed, which is the context behind the verses of hijab and the specification of having to cover the head. So here, that, uh, here is that video right now. We as Muslim women on a daily basis get bombarded by both the philosophical and the social questions regarding hijab. A common argument raised is where does it say in the Quran that we must wear hijab? People argue that the Quran doesn't specifically command us to wear the hijab as in head covering. It only generically talks about the notion of modesty and chastity. How would you answer those who say that the hijab is not wajib and the Quran does not command us to wear the hijab? The question is where in the Quran does it tell us to wear the hijab as in head covering? How would you answer such people? Keep watching. When studying the Quranic revelations, one thing stands clear that the Quran does command us to wear the physical hijab as in our physical head covering. To name a few, Surah Al Nur, verse number 30 and 31, and Surah Al Hazab, verse number 53 and 59, are prime examples of this. But before someone comes and interprets or analyzes these Quranic verses, a few points must be considered. Scholars of tafsir and students of tafsir all know that a few points must be considered and you must obtain knowledge in a few areas before someone comes and analyzes Quranic verses. Let's analyze these points. Number one, one must have knowledge in Islamic jurisprudence. Number two, one must have knowledge in Arabic grammar. Number three, one must have knowledge in narrations in hadith. Number four, one must have knowledge in pre-Islamic Arabian culture. And number five, one must have knowledge in pre-Islamic Arabian poetry. Once someone has grasped these five aspects, then they can come forward and analyze these Quranic verses. So now let's move on to the Quranic verses which talk about hijab. And we see in Surah an nur which is Surah 24, verse number 31, it says, and tell the believing woman to cast down their looks and to guide their private parts and to not display their ornaments except for what seems present. And then it moves on to saying, and pull their head coverings over their bosoms. This ayah is a clear indication of the commandment to wear the head covering as in hijab. The word khumur is used. If you look in any Arabic dictionary, especially the most known Arabic dictionaries, you'll see that khimar by definition means the head coverings as in covering your hair. Now, if we go back to the points we mentioned earlier and look at point number four, as in the pr having knowledge in pre-Islamic Arabian culture, we would see that in pre-Islamic Arabia, women already wore the hijab, the khimar, as in the head coverings. But what they used to do is they used to take the two ends of their hijab and, t and tie it backwards, in a sense, revealing their necks, their ears, and their chest. So when this verse was revealed, Surah to nur verse number 31, Allah says, pull your head coverings over your bosoms. It's a clear indication which commands us to wear the head coverings and also cover our chest and neck. If we look at any educational institute or working environment, 
and we see on their policy it says all shirts must be tucked in. The order indicates that the individual is already wearing a shirt but is ordering them to tuck it in. We see in this Quranic ayah that the Quran orders a woman to tuck her head coverings over her bosoms, indicating that the woman is already wearing a head covering but she must also cover her bosoms as in her chest. So if anyone asks you where in the Quran does it tell a woman to cover her hair or to physically cover herself, you can answer them with these points. As the Quran does clearly mention the word khimar as in head coverings, covering your hair and also tells us to cover ourselves physically and also talks about this social hijab. Join me next time for more educational videos where we address the questions directed at women and the answers and the ways we can tackle these questions. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنَّ Welcome back from that short clip. Uh, I hope you found that clip beneficial. Um, I think I found it quite beneficial. It was nice to have it kind of all laid out and structured like that. Um, prior to the break, we discussed a saying by Lady Fatima alayhi salam when she said the best thing for a woman is not to see men and not to be seen by men. Um, now, I believe during the break we had a caller who um, couldn't be put through, uh, but she her question is, in light of this saying, how, do, how does this saying kind of fit in with um, females who are in the public eye, so for example, we're on TV today. Um, so how, you know, how, how can this saying also be correct and kind of females being in the public eye also be okay? <laughs> okay, um, I think it's about um, whether there is a need. I think hijab is a topic that there is a need for women to discuss mm -hmm. um, because it affects women more generally than it does for men and when a man's talking about hijab because he's not actually having to wear something that is different than the norm um, he can't really empathize yeah. so I think when there is a need then you you know you're encouraged to go out there and and do the bleak and do da'wah mm -hmm. um, and if that's what you feel that you're doing then yeah. you know you're allowed to it's, it's a matter of standing up for your principles and your rights and Bibi Fatima al-Islam showed that, you know, yeah. when she stood up to fight for her right of father, you know, she, she went to the court, into the public and, 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 you know, asked for her claim sort of thing. So when there is a need, then, you know, we need to be, hijab allows us to go out there. Yeah. And um, it still holds right because, again, when it says for me not to see a man, I, I make sure my, my, you know, glance is cast down and I'm not looking with intensity at a man and you know he has been told the same thing so I'm covered and he should not be looking at me either yeah, um, yeah that makes sense <laughs> um, and I guess like you said it, there's a need and I didn't I mean just thinking about this kind of on the spot also I guess it's it's different because not because of the society that we live in but if everyone in society were to follow Islamic rulings, then it wouldn't be, I guess it wouldn't be very difficult to implement this. Yeah. But I guess if one aspect of society um, is kind of, not contrary to Islam, but if one, you kind of have to then deal with certain problems in society accordingly. Um, so just before the break, we were talking about um, hijab allowing or not allowing women to integrate fully into society and I was just about to say that even when it comes to kind of day-to-day -day things like you know oh I have to go and pray now so okay if I you know disappear for 15 minutes people tend to not get I mean in my experience no one so far has been offended or you know um, on the contrary I've actually uh, just last week actually there was a Hindu classmate of ours and a friend of mine needed to go and pray and he said, oh, no, 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 let me get you a prayer mat, I know where it is. And just, 
you know, people, number one, they, no one gets offended. I think sometimes perhaps it's worse in our heads than mm -hmm. it actually turns out to be. And secondly, it's also kind of pleasant to have people accustomed to these things as well around you. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, this is our little way of doing tabliq. It's yeah. like, you know, we're sort of reminding ourselves first and foremost, but others as well, that God is a central part of my life. Yeah. Um, I think I remember when my daughter was very young and um, she sort of turned around and she said to me, I'm so glad I wear hijab. And I asked her why. And she said, because it stops me from committing certain sins. Because as a, as a woman in hijab, you know, as a girl in hijab, there are certain places and certain things I can't do because then people will say, that's what Muslims do. And yeah. she's saying it actually stops me. So it's like, you know, even something as simple as lying. She says, you know, if I lie, then it's like I'm saying, oh, it's okay to lie as a Muslim. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's a really nice way of looking at it rather than sort of looking at the negatives all the time. Yeah. You know, it's like, yes, it does. It, it helps us to remind us ourselves that, yeah. you know, God is a central and focal part of our life and we're, you know, constantly in obedience to his wisdom. Yeah, definitely. Um, what about when it comes to more practical aspects? So, you know, things like, I know, uh, you're familiar with the healthcare profession. So things like, um, you know, certain policies or not even just in the healthcare profession, but just generally speaking, um, there was a study, I think, published in the Independent or the Telegraph, one of the two, um, just at the end of last year. And I believe 30% of employers admitted that they wouldn't consider employing an interviewee who didn't wear makeup to the interview. Um, so when it comes to things like that, I, I guess it's what you kind of said before mm -hmm. the break, which is you you wouldn't want to work with people like that anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think also it's how the question was phrased, because a lot of people think that if you're not wearing makeup, then you're not presentable. So again, just because you're wearing yeah. hijab doesn't mean you have to look a mess. Yeah. You can look very presentable and very professional and yet still be covered. Yeah. So again, it's how the question was asked and what was in the mind of the person who was being asked in what does it mean if they're not yeah. wearing makeup. So, yeah. you know, it, I would love to actually see what, what the, the question was and yeah. what the person understood from the question. Yeah. Um, because I think we're very lucky in you know, where we live in that most people are okay. And, and they... And, and, you know, the amazing thing is because there are so many Muslim women who wear hijab, it's it's not something that's out of the norm. And yeah. people are very used to it now. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, it's like there were very few women who mm -hmm. were wearing, you know, so it's like when you did wear hijab, it, you know, it was like, oh, what, is she, yeah, yeah. what is she wearing? Yeah. Why is she dressed like that? Whereas now it's, it's totally Completely normal. Completely normal. Yeah. So Just it's, today, um, I got on the tube and I, by coincidence, I ended up sitting next to a lady in hijab. And... I was just thinking to myself, I think every single day this week in my carriage, there has been at least one person who's wearing hijab. And it's become such a normal thing. Um, yeah, alhamdulillah. I'm, uh, you know, we're so, I, I think we're really fortunate to yeah, live It's in become society. very acceptable. And it's, again, like you're saying, I think we play it up in our heads yeah. more than it actually is. Definitely. And we, we come up with these scenarios, which <laughs> yeah. will probably never happen sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, if we go to a kind of more specific um, look at hijab, what exactly are the requirements of hijab? So in terms of uh, physical hijab, so okay. what exactly are you um, talking about? Before I answer that, can I just um, start off with saying how when you look at any order um, given by God, uh, any wajibat um, or you know haramat that you're supposed to stay away from, um, we need to realize why we're doing it. Um, so first and foremost, you know, why do I wear hijab? Because God's told me to. As a Muslim, that means I submit to God's wisdom. Yeah. So I'm wearing hijab because my Lord has told me to. And that is a satisfactory answer. There are other reasons, but they're secondary to the primary reason. It's about servitude. Mm -hmm. And if I can, you know, submit to Allah's will, then I have passed the test and that's what it's about. Yeah. Okay, once you, you've got God and then the second person you do it is for yourself because we've been created very selfish human yeah. beings. So we have to see the, you know, the benefit that yeah. it is, does for us. And we've seen that, you know, the benefit of the fact that, you know, you, you take more care of your own inner self rather than your, your outer body. Yeah. 
Um, you know, you, it gives you more confidence. It gives you more self-respect. Mm -hmm. It allows you to sort of, you know, um, show people what who you are rather than what you are. Yeah. Um, and it also protects you as well because, you know, th those um, glances may not stop at the glance. It may lead to something more. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, the hijab to a certain extent protects you from that. And then the third person that you do it, the third reason, you know, you do it for the third sort of category. So you've done it for God, you've done it for yourself. And then it's about, you know, Islam has never been about just me and my God. It's about the rest of creation as well. So again, taking into account that God has created men a certain way, I need to realize that and I need to sort of do it for my Muslim brothers as well. Um, yes, they've been told to cast down their glance. But again, if I'm making it difficult for them to cast down their glance, what a sort of Muslim sister am I? So, you know, it's, I, I think we need to realize that, you know, they've been, they've been created that way. It's not, they're not doing, you know, it's, it's not something that they have, well, obviously they have control over, but yeah. it's not something that, you know, um, it, they're totally different to the way that we've been yeah. created. So we need to sort of take that into account and sort of care enough about them to sort of make it easier yeah. as much as we can to them. It's, it's like um, the example I used to give my daughter when she was young. It's, you know, if, if you, um, if there was a person who was very hungry um, and they couldn't afford to eat, you wouldn't sit there in front of them and have all this lavish food and not give yeah. them any. Mm. And it's the same sort of principle. If you're not going to marry that person and have a, a, you know, a relationship which is allowed in the eyes of God, then why do you want to flaunt yourself yeah. in front of that person? It's not fair. Why mm. would you do that? So it's that same sort of yeah. principle. Okay, um, so taking all that into account, then you look at what God has actually directed you yeah. um, in the physical hijab. And um, the Quran says to cover everything that is not apparent. According to the uh, jurists, that means everything except the face and the hands. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to cover your head, your whole body, except your face and your hands. And that includes your feet as well. Yeah. So even in the summer when it's really hot, we have to wear socks or yeah. you know, wear shoes which actually cover our feet, not sandals. Um, and it's not just about covering in the sense that you just you just have a you know uh, you can wear tight skinny jeans and you know a top sort of thing, it has to be covering in a way that the shape of your body isn't shown. Yeah. So, you know you don't have to wear the the abaya and the chador or anything. It's you know Islam hasn't dictated you have to wear a specific type of mm -hmm. hijab, but it's you know you wear what you want as long as you're you're fully covered. It's not transparent and mm -hmm. the shape of your body is not being seen by mm -hmm. anyone. Yeah. Um. A lot of people kind of uh, probably share this question with me, which is um, Lady Fatima alayhi salam, she, you know, you could, it would be fair to say that she is kind of the embodiment of modesty. Mm -hmm. um, hijab is something that we automatically, without thinking, kind of associate with her. And then, so that's one side. And then on the other hand, she's one of these most powerful um most influential woman in history who you know has a legacy which is so massive um, and I guess the question is how do you kind of reconcile the two because on the one hand there's this whole notion of um, kind of I guess it's kind of like the question that the caller um, put through which is on the one hand you kind of have this notion of modesty and um, not staying hidden, but kind of not being in the public eye so much. And then mm. on the other hand, you've got all these accomplishments, which are very public. So um, how do those two kind of go together? Okay, first and foremost, um, I think the most amazing thing about Bibi Fatima al-Islam is the fact that she did it in such a short span of life. It's yeah. like, you know, wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, you know, um, we're sort of, you know, so old and we're still not getting there sort of thing. But yeah, it's, and it's about, again, I've never heard anyone mention how beautiful she was mm -hmm. or the fact that she had specific color eyes or she had really nice skin or, yeah. or she was a size eight or, you know, there is no, no mention of that. So again, it, it, she, you know, it wasn't, she wasn't flaunting that because yeah. that wasn't important. Mm -hmm. What she was showing the public was her intellect, yeah. her soul, her you know, her purity, and, and that's what it's about. And it's yeah. like, that's what we need to get across. It's like, if we cover ourselves, then we will be taken seriously 
about the things that we're saying rather than you know half sort of listening to what we're saying and half looking at what mm -hmm. we're looking you know what yeah. we look like so you know sh she's actually shown that the hijab allowed her yeah. to you know be in the public eye yeah. you know to be able to leave this legacy behind definitely um, without having to compromise her modesty in yeah. any way whatsoever in a way you could say that hijab almost i would say it does act as a filter um which kind of puts you in control mm. of what other people or what you're exposing of yourself um and i think um i'm not quite sure who it was i think it was a revert um i was watching an interview of um a female revert who had come to islam and she was saying how i think she was a uh, mechanics student or she she basically was studying a degree that was very 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 yeah. male dominated mm -hmm. um i think she was one of i think five girls in the entire course mm -hmm. and she said that as soon as she converted and she put on the hijab when for example she'd be giving presentations or she'd have to do a bit of public speaking or basically she had to address all these males she said i felt like people were really paying attention but not to me but mm, to what, what I, was saying. I was saying mm. so um exactly yeah and it and that's what it's about it's like again you know it's very easy for us as women to say well why can't they listen to us yeah. but we've not been created the same yeah. way so you know it, it's if we're going to sit there and, and you know sort of dress skimply then you're going to get men looking at you you know you're you're asking for men to look at you yeah. um and uh, the thing is, we've also, you know, we want to be admired mm. by men as well. You know, we've been created in a way that we yeah. want, and that's why God's, you know, it, it, there's so many hadiths that talk about how a woman should dress up for her husband. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're given a chance to actually show off your beauty yeah. to the person who actually matters to you and the person who actually cares yeah. for you and will take, you know, will, mm -hmm. and loves you, sort of thing. So, you know, it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. So you, you know, you you be taken seriously outside, and at home, the person who knows you, who takes you seriously, yeah. can actually enjoy your beauty as well. Yeah. Um, I guess one thing that perhaps many of us forget when it comes to hijab or any other Islamic ruling is that Islam is more about regulation than it is about restriction. So, so as a woman, I am allowed to show my beauty, but there's a certain time and place for it and a certain mm -hmm. audience. And so, you know, with everything, I guess it's it's almost as if everything kind of comes to moderation yeah so even hijab is to moderate not really to restrict mm. or to restrain but yeah. just kind of filters out what's appropriate and what's not and gives you a time and a place for it yeah, exactly. um one of the other stories um from the life of Bivatama, uh is a quite a famous one again where um the the story of the blind man <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just let you elaborate on that because I don't want to <laughs> say it wrong or anything. But um, can you tell us a bit about this, you know, this incident? Okay. Um, it, as I remember it, um, the Holy Prophet came in um, to Bibi Fatima al-Islam's house with, with a blind man. And Bibi Fatima al-Islam wore her hijab, you know, covered herself. And when the blind man went, the Prophet asked her, um, he was blind, why did you cover yourself? Mm -hmm. And her, her answer was amazing. She said, he may be blind, but I wasn't, but I'm not. Yeah. Again, a lot of what the Ahlul Bayt uh, and the Holy Prophet did was to teach us. Yeah. So again, it's that concept of, you know, knowing as a woman that I've been created in order to attract the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And I may do it inadvertently. Yeah. I may do it without even realizing. Yeah. So the hijab reminds me that I, there needs to be a barrier. Yeah. So it's a matter of, you know, he may be blind and he may not see me, but yeah. I can see him. Yeah. And I need to make sure that I don't say anything or do anything or, you know, um, that may attract him towards me. Okay. Um, inshallah, we'll continue with this um, chain of thoughts after the break. Uh, but again, the show is flying by. Um, it is time for another short break. So please don't go away. Stay tuned. We'll see you in a few minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, 
Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear viewers. You are watching Women's View Live here on Al Bayt TV. For those of you who have just tuned in, we are discussing hijab and modesty through the eyes of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. Um, this is the season where we are mourning her tragedy and um, her martyrdom. So um, it only seems appropriate that we look at the lessons that we can take from her and her life. And today, this topic, I guess, is one that's strongly associated with um, Lady Fatima. And just before the break, you know, we were saying how on the one hand, she's so strongly associated with modesty and, you know, hijab. And, and then I guess she used that in order to accomplish so much and such huge feats. So it's been a brilliant discussion so far. As always, this is a live show. So if you'd like to join the discussion, if you have any comments, if you have any experiences, um, if you have any input to the discussion this evening, the number is on your screen, 0203 4117 you can tweet at Elbeit TV as many of you have been doing. You can tweet me. You can comment on our Facebook page, and finally, you can email women to you at Elbeit TV. Um, just before the break, we were talking about the story of the blind man, and um, I think the last thing you said was um, that I can't remember what the last <laughs> thing you said was, but. Um, you know, the Fatima Zahra's reply was, he may be blind, but I'm not. And in a way, you could say that that kind of highlights our benefit from hijab. So, you know, you mm -hmm. said that the primary reason is because we are submitting to Allah and this is his command and so we're obeying it. But secondly, there's also benefit in it for us. Mm -hmm. And I guess that is, in a, you know, you could say she was wearing that hijab for her because he wasn't going to see anything. Um, so I guess the next question to bring up is hijab isn't just a physical thing then because he couldn't see her. So there was no physical kind of, he wasn't going to see anything physical basically. Um, so often we hear that you know, hijab is not just about the covering. Hijab is not just about the way you dress, although that is a big part of it, mm -hmm. as we just um, explored. Um, but there is also social hijab, which is again another hot topic. Mm -hmm. um, so, what do we mean when we say social hijab? Oh God, you could sit here and talk about social hijab. Yeah, very <laughs> <laughs> just. Yes, um, it's. I think it's the interaction between mm -hmm. males and females. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about keeping the interaction to what is necessary and um, keeping it there with a barrier. So knowing mm. that, you know, he is mahram to you, he is, yeah. you know, there, there is, there should be a barrier. So you're not sort of fully relaxed mm -hmm. and, you know, the way you talk to, to the opposite sex yeah. is, you know, with modesty. Mm -hmm. So you're not sort of laughing and joking or you're not yeah. sort of talking in a very soft, you know, sort of seductive voice either. Um, and like you said, that because of that social hijab and the physical hijab, then I as a woman can go out and, you know, propagate Islam and, and stand up for my rights and, and do whatever I need to do, whether it's dropping my kids to school, whether it's going out to work or just even, you know, going shopping or whatever. But I can do that mm -hmm. um, because the hijab allows me to. And I'm protecting you know, I'm submitting to the will of Allah, I'm protecting myself, not only my physical body, but my soul. And I am also, you know, sort of helping the brothers protect themselves as well. So sort of benefits all around. Yeah. <laughs> um, as there is with um, everything that we've been commanded to, yeah. you know, just I'm, I'm quite amazed. And I shouldn't be amazed because, you know, we follow Islam, so we should kind of know why we're doing what we're doing. But it is quite amazing that every single command that we've been given, there, I mean, it may not be possible to know every single reason why we're commanded to do it, but I don't think there's anything that we've been told to do where we, we don't know a single benefit mm. of, you know, what, what are we gaining from it. Yeah, um, as I said, I think... We need to know that because we are very selfish human beings and it's very difficult to submit to something yeah. that you can't see the benefit in yourself. And I think, you know, when you get to the stage where you can actually submit 
to God's words and not have to ask why, then it's like, wow, I've got there. Because yeah. I, I truly believe he is doing it for my sake, not yep. for him. Because it, it makes no difference to God whether I yeah. submit to him or not. It's for my own self. And I think the mistake that we make is when we try to understand a ruling, we're looking at it from the physical aspect because mm -hmm. that's all we've experienced. Yeah. Whereas most of the rulings are for the soul because that's who we are and that's what's yeah. going to continue to eternity. Mm -hmm. So because we don't understand how the soul works and what it requires, God out of his mercy and love has given us these rulings in order to not only protect our soul, but to actually allow it to grow yeah. to perfection. Mm -hmm. And once we realize that, then it's so much easier to sort of think, okay, you know what? I really can't see the benefit that this has on my physical body, but I know that there's a benefit that it has on my soul because I know God wouldn't tell me anything yeah. just for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it like that, then you know your, your whole mindset changes and you do it with a lot more passion because you know you're getting something out of it. Yeah, and I guess even on the flip side, when these things are kind of more difficult to implement, again, it kind of gives you that push mm. that, no, there must be something that I'll get out of this. Um, and again, it, it sounds very selfish, but like I said, being created with that <laughs> selfishness within us. Um, so, I mean, social hijab and physical hijab, how important is it to, you know, for the two to... Um, for the two to kind of be on the same level because you know some we live in a society where i don't think there is a concept of social hijab um at all i was trying to think of an example but there is no example there isn't i personally don't think there is any concept of social hijab but i mean how important is it that you know our act our mannerisms kind of match the physical appearance of modesty and hijab as well. I think they're both as important as each other. Um, I think with the physical hijab, I think the problem is uh, a lot of Muslim girls think that if they cover their hair, that's that's all that's required. It's um, I, I do tuition at home and um, I was talking to one of the lads that I, I tutor and um, he, he said to me, I don't understand these girls who wear these skinny tight jeans and t-shirts and yet they've got their hair covered. And she's saying, I, I don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to me as a guy. And I'm like, poor thing. And it, you know, it, it just makes you realize you're not thinking it through. It's yeah. like, you know, yes, you're covering your hair and you're making yourself look slightly different to your friends, who, you know, who are not Muslims. Yeah. And if you're going to that trouble, then why not do it properly and actually get the benefit yeah. of it? Because again, every time we, we submit to the will of Allah, we're benefiting from it. And, you know, our, our soul is growing from mm -hmm. that. So, you know, it, it's a matter of doing it the way that it's required. So covering yourself. And, you know, you can't just sit there and put your sleeves up and think, you know, it's okay, it's only my arm. No one's going to yeah. sort of be attracted to my arm. But it's not about being attracted to the arm. It's God's told you cover yourself, yeah. you know, up to the wrist. So you cover yourself up to the wrist. Yeah. And from that, you will benefit. It's like we... We don't sit there and praise the line and say, okay, today I'm not going to do two such those. You know, I'll, I'll do four instead or I'll do one. You know, you yeah. don't do that. You, you, you know, you pray a certain way because that's yeah. what God's told you to mm -hmm. do. It. And it's the same with the physical hijab. God's told you that you cover your hair. And that means the whole of your hair, yeah. not, you know, with a little bit sort of coming out at the front. Um, and you cover your body so that the body is not shown, you know, the, the shape of the body is not shown. So that's the physical aspect. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the social aspect, um, which goes hand in hand with the physical aspect. So, yep. yes, you do have to interact with the opposite sex. If you're at college, if you're at work, you know, you will have, you know, male um, counteracts who you have to interact with. But then again, it's a matter of, yes, I am interacting with you, but I'm, you know, I'm, there is a barrier there and, and they need to respect that barrier. Yeah. And if you're going to sit there and, and laugh and joke and, and be totally comfortable with them, then they will see past that physical hijab yeah. and they will think it's okay mm -hmm. for them to you know, um, look at you in a certain way or, or make a certain move towards you or ask you out because yeah. you've allowed that barrier to be yeah. brought down. And I guess it's such a kind of commonly used phrase and, but in this case I really feel like, yes, it makes perfect sense, which is if, if an individual doesn't respect themselves, then there is absolutely no point expecting respect That's from people others. people to respect you. It's very true. It's so true.
do you think maybe or this could be a separate issue or maybe this kind of is responsible for um some of the scenarios that you know your your duty was confused by which is um hijab being subjective so you know from place to place or from era to era hijab is kind of i wouldn't say evolved but you know there are obvious differences mm. um in these aspects so you know is how flexible can we get I think that's the beauty of Islam. It allows you to fit into whatever environment and whatever age you live in. Mm -hmm. And that's why God's not dictated that you have to wear a chador or you have to wear an abaya or you have to wear a certain color. You know, it's, it's about dressing in a way that covers you, but you fit in at the same time. Yeah. So there may be certain places where your sort of hijab is more in that you feel, okay, you know what, here I... I want to wear an abaya or a chador because I'm not comfortable with just wearing baggy clothes. Yeah. You know, and it it shouldn't matter what you're wearing as long as you're covered in a way that your shape is not shown. And again, it's not about just being covered. I think I think what we need to do is realize that when you move, certain parts of your body show as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not just standing there in front of the mirror and saying, oh, "Okay, I'm covered here." It's like, yeah. and that, that's why God said, you know ensure that the head covering comes over your bosom because mm -hmm. it's you know if you are alhamdulillah gifted then it's more difficult to sort of you know yeah. ensure that the shape of your body doesn't show yeah so again it's you know if you're not going to wear your hijab in a way that it covers your bosom then wear a shawl or something on top yeah. or, or an extra overgarment or something that will actually cover that so when you actually move again the shape of your body is not shown yeah. but it, how you do it is totally your decision yeah and what color you wear is your decision you know it, it's as long as it you don't stand out yeah so again if you're gonna you know say go to you know a place a religious place or something where everyone is wearing black and you're wearing bright red or something yeah. then obviously you may be covered but yeah. you're that's not hijab because you're making yourself stand out so it's, yeah. it's about blending in but with the hijab not sort of oh okay i stand out because i'm wearing hijab so i need to take my hijab off yeah. no it's about blending in but with the hijab yeah um it's interesting because this was quite a while back and I was listening to the radio and there was this debate about, um, I think it, they were talking about the hijab ban in France and this man called in and he said, you know, I, the hijab provides no freedom and I think freedom is to just not to have to wear anything at all. And he said all this rubbish and, <laughs> and then someone else called in and said, actually, freedom is to wear what you want. Mm -hmm. Um, and hijab in a way like you said that no one's you know no one's come and told us you have to wear black or you have to wear you know like you said it's very in a way Islam kind of allows for that individualism mm -hmm. as well which I think a lot of people don't realize um, that there is this flexibility so um, and I think the other problem is when people think of Islam they think of the cultural yeah. aspect of Islam rather than the religious yeah, aspect definitely. of Islam. So bec just because you have people who come from a cultural background where the man dictates certain mm -hmm. things to his wife, yeah. um, they think that's what Islam is. That's not what Islam is. Yeah. No one tells me what to do. I decide. God's yeah. given me a brain and I decide to submit to his will. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it's not submission. And it's not submission to a life. I'm yeah. just, you know, doing what my husband's telling me. It's about, yes, he obviously he will guide me because he loves me and he wants me to reach my perfection um, but it's about you know I have a brain and I can think things through yeah. uh, you know a lot of times like um, you know again it's like you know you wear hijab so you're automatically people tend to think she can't speak English or she can't think for herself and you know mm -hmm. and it's like excuse me <laughs> you know I, I have grown up in this country yeah. I've gone to university you know I'm qualified I, I can speak you know and I, and I, and I can you know hold my own yeah just because I'm wearing a certain clothes doesn't mean, and, and that's that's because they're taking it back to the cultural aspect rather yep. than, you know, the, definitely. And that's that's the that's our fault as Muslims because we've, you know, certain cultures have allowed their men or, you know, have allowed the men to treat yeah. their women like that. Islam gives so much, you know, so much dignity to women. Mm. It's, it's unbelievable. It's yeah. like you know there are so many rules for us rather than against yeah, exactly. us. Exactly. Exactly. Um, 
just I think a couple of years, three years ago now, um, I decided to join a pottery class in my spare time and I was there and um, the instructor was asking me about, you know, what, like, what do I do? And I was, I told her that I was about to start university and she had this look of shock on her <laughs> face. She's like, oh, oh, I didn't realise you, you people were allowed to go to university. <laughs> and it was the most patronising moment of my life. But again, like you said, I think uh, the majority, I would say, you know, 90% of the misconceptions that lie out there about Islam and particularly about women in Islam are, are due to us not differentiating between culture and religion. Mm. And also not knowing what our rights are in Islam. Yeah. It's like if we knew what our rights were, we would, we would not be bragging yeah, about them. Exactly. Right and, we, and we wouldn't actually stand for you know, a lot of what goes on in, yeah. in, in the culture. Definitely. Um, I mean, we have, a, I think, just over 10 minutes of the show left. Um, but a very big question, which I know is very difficult to kind of summarize. Um, but I mean, just to kind of round off, um, Fatima Zahra is such a great woman. And a lot of the time, you might hear people saying, well, you know, she's so amazing and she's so great and she's so beyond us. But <laughs> that then becomes an excuse to kind of give up before we've even started. But, you know, as we said at the beginning of the show, you know, it's our duty, not just during these periods of mourning, but, you know, day in, day out, we should be looking to to gain examples from her to try and implement her teachings in her uh, in our lives so i mean when it comes to you know her accomplishments and and her modesty and her dignity and her self respect um how can we kind of gain <laughs> a few you know how can we be inspired by that and maybe it's a tough wow. question <laughs> <laughs> um First of all, I think it's it's wrong to think that oh um, she's so beyond us that we we yeah. can't even aim towards that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we probably will never get to her level, but then we're constantly bettering ourselves because we're constantly aiming for something that yeah. is really really high up. If you aim for something that is low, then once you get there, you've got nothing to aim for. Yeah. So it's it's good to actually aim for something that is so high that mm -hmm. you know you're constantly working yeah. towards that. Um, and the other thing that the other beauty about having the Ahlul Bayt is that we know that they're not dead as such yeah. you know in like the in the holy quran god says those who died in the way of allah are, are not dead they're not you know they're still they're sustained by allah yeah. and they're still there so we know that they're there and we can talk to them and yeah. we can you know ask for their help so again build a relationship with Bibi fatima al -Islam where you know you turn to her and you ask her to help you and guide you and, and show you where you're going wrong yeah you know, it's like, it, it's amazing. It's like, I, I think to me, Bibi Fatima Al Islam is my role model when it comes to being a wife and a mother. Mm -hmm. And whenever I have any problems or any discussions <laughs> within, you know, in the family, when it's to do with my husband or to my, with my children, she's the first person I'll turn to. And I was like, yeah. you know what? You did it. You were the perfect mother. You were yeah. the perfect wife. And, you know, you managed it and I, you need to show me how because yeah. I have no clue. I'm, you know, I'm messing up here. I, I don't know what I'm doing. I've not, you know, the, the funny thing is, it's like, you know, go to university for four or five years, you know, to do dentistry where you're just literally concentrating on the mouth of yeah. a human being and yet you become a mother with no qualifications at all. You're not taught what you're supposed to do or yeah. how you're supposed to do it and everything. So, it, you know, and here you're looking after a whole human being, not just the mouth. So, yeah. you know, it's really, really difficult. And you need, you need these, you know, amazing role models and amazing people who, who love you, who will help you, yeah. you know, throughout your whole life. So it's not just, you know, your, your mother who's a fallible, who may have made mistakes, um, or who will not live, you know, forever and, and may not be there. And, and whereas, you know, people like the Ahlul Bayt are there through your whole life, they will never let you yeah. down. They're infallible. They've never made mistakes. They know what is perfection. They know how to help you. They know your in, ins and outs. They know, you know, what you're thinking and yeah. how you're going wrong. So, you know, actually build a relationship with them where you can actually ask them and, and they will help you. You know, it's, it's, 
yes, we build a relationship with God and we ask him, but sometimes it's, it's easier to build a relationship with a human being than it is with God. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a relationship with yeah. God. Obviously, your relationship with the Ahlul Bayt should take you yeah. and strengthen your relationship with God. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Sorry, I've forgotten the question you asked. <laughs> uh, my question was just, you know, um, kind of to, to round off, how can we take f from, from her life? Yeah, from from the life of Atan Sahar, from her accomplishments and, you know, her example and implement it into ours. I think um, the main thing that I learned from Ibn Fatima al Islam is, is this concept of submission. Mm -hmm. It's knowing that my God loves me yep. and tells me what to do for my sake, yeah. for me to reach my perfection. And once I've got that in my head, then it's so much easier to follow the rules, knowing that I'm benefiting from it, and knowing that there's nothing that will hold me back. If I put my mind to something, I can achieve it yeah. because I have God on my side. And you know, nothing should scare me, nothing should overwhelm me, um, you know, that, that sort of confidence that you see in Bibi Fatima al yeah. that's because she knew God was by her side, yeah. God was helping her through it all. And, you know, nothing sort of pushed her over the edge or nothing sort of, you know, made her sort of, you know, think, oh my God, I can't do this. You know, it's, it's about, yeah, of course I can do it. Why can't I? Yeah. If I'm doing it with the near that it is for God and this is what God requires yeah. from me, then yes, of course I'm going to do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to achieve it. Why wouldn't I? Because yeah. I'm doing it with the right near, so obviously I'm going to achieve it. Yeah. And, you know, if you go in with that sort of positive attitude, you've won half the battle already yeah. before you've even started it sort of thing. You know, it's like, you know, when you give a presentation or a speech and you, and you do it with the near that it's, it's for God and this is what God requires from you, you've already, you know, won over the audience before you've even started talking because yeah. the confidence and the positivity that you radiate you know, they pick up on that. Yeah. So I think the main thing that I learned from Bibi Fatima al Islam is her, how she managed to achieve so much in such a small lifespan. Um, and that was because of God. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So it, it's knowing I need to submit to God and know that he's there yeah. all the way. Definitely, I agree. And, you know, you, I kind of picked up on what you said when you said that she, because, because she knew that God was by her side, nothing fazed her. Mm. And I mean, not to draw a comparison, but kind of to draw contrast, um, looking at our lives. Um, perhaps she got to, she accomplished that much very quickly because there was no time for anything to phase her. Mm. Um, maybe in our lives, because I think a problem of ours is that we we don't articulate our intentions a lot or ever or at all so you know we set out to do things and maybe sometimes in the back of our minds we we do have pure intentions and we do have good intentions but sometimes they're very vague and so i think it's important you know when we start anything so be it our studies or anything at all that we're doing in life it's so important to sit down and actually explain to yourself why you're doing it and I think because because Fatima Zahra knew so well why she was doing everything she kind of just had that focus focus yeah. on that goal and with us we we have a goal but because we don't know why we're doing it we kind of don't know I guess we get distracted mm. on the way and things do phase us because we we lack that kind of confidence and that drive and that kind of attitude of nothing's going to stop me I just need to keep going yeah and I think and also it's like knowing what your ultimate goal is I think we forget that there is an ultimate goal we focus on these little goals yeah and we get so worked up about them and so involved in that that we forget the ultimate goal yeah. which is God and I think sh that was her focus and that's why you see that whatever she did it always led back to God mm -hmm. it was always about getting closer to him yeah and I think if we realize that, then again, it will help us to become better Muslims, better human beings yeah. and reach our own perfection. Inshallah. 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 Um, thank you so, so much thank for you. the show today. I really, really learned so much and I'm sure the viewers have learned a lot. Um, to the viewers, thank you for watching. I do apologize if I didn't manage to read out your comments or your tweets or your emails. Um, 
and also if anyone tried to call in I do apologize if you didn't get through thank you so much for watching inshallah next week we'll also have um, I think our penultimate Fatimiyah, um a Women's View Live show as well so that's next Thursday at 8pm so thank you once again for watching thank you and um, we'll see you next week Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh